Hello everyone, welcome back to the Anechoic Chamber. Today's video is the first in what will probably be a seven part series on general relativity. General relativity is, in a nutshell, the science of space curvature, essentially gravity. We're gonna explain all of the math behind this. We're gonna go into the LIGO experiment, which detected gravitational waves. And we're even probably going to culminate with a discussion on mathematically possible warp drives. Mathematically. But to get there, we need to build it up from special relativity first. So that's what the focus of today's video is going to be, is just special relativity. The math, twin paradox, uh, relativistic uh, GPS adjustments. Uh, Lorentz transform, very important, and then finally getting up into four-dimensional space. But that's where it's going to stop. The second and consequent videos, subsequent videos, are going to be actual general relativity, and we are not going to shy away from the math at all. However, I am going to pull Ben back many times and make him explain things. So if you've got an interest in this topic at more than just a pop sci level, I think this is going to be the video series for you. Enjoy. All right. I believe that's the official technique. <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> Benji. Hey. Welcome back. I'm back to discuss some more scientific progress and cool topics. Oh? Yeah. I think it is uh, not hyperbolic to say that the discovery of, the, or rather the experimental finding of the millennium, and at least astronomy, has been this paper over here specifically the ligo institute being able to detect gravitational waves that came from for the first one from a black from a binary black hole merger uh what's so cool about this is one we've kind of predicted from einstein's uh, general relativity that these things sh these gravitational waves should be out there but it allows for us to interact with the universe in a way that is fundamentally different from everything else that we've been able to do before. Right. Initially, right. Bold we, claim. Huh? That's a bold claim. Isn't it? The, everything that you've been able to do so far, and I know you worked with Gube and done a decent amount of Astro stuff, all of the ways that we're able to detect and see what the stars, you know, do what the universe looks like is literally that it's seeing it's electromagnetic radiation, whether it's, visible spectrum where you've actually looked up with a telescope, just used your eye, whether you did radio interferometry like Doug did. Um, this all... is interferometry at a whole new level, though. Uh, yeah. Like in, that's, in, this in... is far more sensitive than anything we ever did. Absolutely. Well, it's, it's a effectively um, way of looking at how wavelengths of light are adjusted by gravitational waves. So yes, we're still using light, but the thing that is interacting with us is not necessarily the light itself. It's the waves of curvature that are coming to us. And I thought it would be really cool to, in the next sequence of talks, talk about and build up an actual understanding of how gravitational waves were predicted and kind of go over the discovery that LIGO brought us. Because, again... Uh, I do not think it is too much to claim that this is one of the, this will be for the next thousand years of human history, one of the top things that we've discovered, right? It's, okay. it's one of the strong confirmations of general relativity, an entirely new phenomena that it predicted that we hadn't been able to see before. And then we were, and now we have stronger evidence that general relativity, it might be the correct theory to consider. <laughs> Which is always, you know, um, at this scale, at this scale, it's always a, a fun thing to have more and more evidence of a theory being right. And it helps narrow down. Well, you know, what we currently know is that the two big theories, quantum mechanics and general relativity, they fight with each other. They're not exactly happy to cooperate. And somewhere there must be new physics that melds them together. And with more evidence that we put we, that we you know add to a theory of bag it it means that oh okay we can stop looking here now we can search in new areas and try and imagine where it can break down right so the way that i envision this i think it's going to be 
pretty straightforward. We're going to, over the next few topics, uh, the next few talks, build up first special relativity, its implications and what happens, um, how that kind of messes with our Newtonian everyday experience, some of the cool things that that happens. Um, then we'll talk about, generalize that to how general relativity comes from special relativity and show Einstein's basic equation for the universe, the, the thing that drives all of, all of the astronomical phenomena that we see. Basically is, as far as general relativity can tell, go, f falls from that equation, including uh, you know black holes being actually one of the first and simplest solutions that we found to it, which is a, a fascinating topic in and of itself. And then we, once we have that a, a bit of a handle on what general relativity should look like, then we can extend it, do a small approximation, and show, hey, this theory very quickly says you should be seeing waves of expanding and contracting space-time, gravitational waves throughout the universe, because when you have accelerating sources of field or curvature effectively you should be getting radiation away from it. just like how a radio tower right the waves that it's produced is from an electric charge being oscillated up and down it's being accelerated back and forth in a similar way we should be seeing those kinds of waves coming from gravitational bodies bodies of mass so where do we start well at the beginning of course Specifically, let's just go with the history. The first thing that really hinted people having to wonder about reality being a little bit different than what we expected came from uh, electromagnetism, actually. Uh, we've gone over this several times before, but we know that uh, E and B fields, the things that make up electromagnetism, follow... follow the wave equation when done properly, i.e. I'm going to get something like C squared. Let's zoom out just a little bit. Here we go. Something that C squared times the second space derivative of an E field should equal the second time derivative of that same field, right? This is your basic wave equation, that the acceleration that uh, a wave sees, so its second derivative in time, is related in some way to its physical shape as you move throughout space. And the constant that relates those two is the speed that the wave moves in. Now, an important point is that when developing this, this uh, equation, Right when doing electromagnetism, you don't have any reference to the frame, actually, the frame that you are observing the objects in this theory. Effectively, I can develop this equation for any point in space time, whether I'm sitting still, whether I'm moving on a train, the equation that pops out is the same. Now, to everyone, uh, yes. Okay. To any to any inertial frame that you can come up with, which basically is just any frame that's not undergoing acceleration, so sitting still or moving in a straight line. Um, now, what we also know from classical physics, one of the very beginning things, is the idea that if I want to transfer between inertial frames, say, you know. Uh, you and your wife are tossing the ball back and forth in your yard and I happen to be driving by, how the velocity of that ball or the position of that ball moving back and forth uh, will look in your frame versus my frame is a little different, right? So if I look at, if we freeze frame a moment in time, right? Your, if you're seeing the ball in position X, and I see the ball in position x prime, the question is, what is the equation 
that relates these two? Well, Galilean transform says, oh, okay, all I have to do is look at the velocity v that I'm moving at, the time difference between when the ball, you know, was initially thrown, uh, how, how long I've had to move uh, relative to where the ball was. Uh, it says, oh, okay, I just simply subtract. If I want to know the relative velocities, right? If I want to know how the ball will, the speed of the ball will look in my frame compared to yours, I simply take this equation and take the time derivative of it, right? Um, right, the idea that I will look at the velocity that I will see the ball moving at, the derivative of x prime with respect to time, uh, I suppose I should say in my frame, t, time, t prime, is just the velocity that you'll see, right, dx dt, minus, and here we assume since I'm in an inertial frame, my velocity is constant, so the time derivative of v times t is simply v. So I take the velocity that I'm moving at, separate it from the speed of the ball that you would see, and that's the speed that I'll see. An important caveat here is that Galilean transforms uh, require Basically, that the time that I see, right, the ball at a particular position is exactly the same time that you would see the ball in the equivalent position for your frame. Basically, t prime and t are exactly the same. What this implies with, combined with this wave equation, is instead of now just a ball, let's say you're shooting a beam of light back and forth, right? And let's say you've got a single photon. Somehow you can isolate a single photon and you've sent it to Billy, who's going to bounce it back to you uh, with a uh, mirror. The moment, the, the velocity that you will see the photon coming out of your source should be the speed of light, basically in a vacuum, right? Because the atmosphere doesn't really, the atmosphere doesn't really adjust the velocity that it comes out at. Well, uh, the same thing happen the the Galilean transform says that okay what I should see if you see the speed of light is if I'm traveling you know against the velocity the distance the the, the direction that the photon is traveling I should see the velocity of light minus my own speed right what this implies is that there is a proper place in the universe to look at light to get the wave equation that we do right because the wave equation in theory, somewhere in the universe is not moving right okay i have to i have to find some place that's not moving relative to the photon now the initial thought was that okay maybe there's some medium that people have to be at rest with um and if you're at rest with a the medium then that's where physics is about that's where electromagnetism is absolutely correct now what michelson uh found in I think I don't remember my dates. The a while ago, yeah, uh, around not, 1900. I don't yeah. remember which side not of it too is on. Far back. It's terrible. Um, it's fine. I'm very bad at dates. Is that the is that there was no luminous ether, which is what they thought the medium was, because if Earth is moving around in a circle, well, if there's a field that propagates light waves, right? There's going to be points where you're moving in one direction with respect to that, that field and when you're moving in the other direction. And so you should see a difference in the velocity of light that you capture, right? From some, whatever. But they didn't find that evidence. And so they were so going, hmm, how does this even work? Eventually it was realized, right? We've gone over this, that E and B fields are their own medium. They just bounce off each other effectively. Um, and that's what allows them to propagate through empty space without anything. Uh, but then the question is, okay, how does this theory of there is one proper frame to look at the universe fit within that framework? And it was a big problem. And so it took a big brain boy like Einstein to come along and say, hmm, one of the things that we have stuck with is this homogeneity of space the idea that physics should look the same on earth as it does anywhere else that was what led galileo to realize that hey the um the heliocentric model of the of the solar system is probably correct right versus the geocentered um it was realizing oh we have the strong principle of everything should look this physics should look the same no matter where i'm at or where i'm looking at it 
And so Einstein came up with the principle of relativity, specifically that identical experiments carried out in different inertial frames should give identical results, right? It shouldn't matter that you and Billy are standing still when you're throwing the ball back and forth. That picture shouldn't look any different to me who's driving through a car at a constant velocity in another inertial frame. It's that extension that, okay, the results of seeing, for example, how long does it take for your photon to travel out to Billy and then come back to you? And you measure the velocity of that light, that experiment should have the same result for you as it does for me. Right. Right. Assuming you're not riding the brake pedal. Right. Just so people are clear that an inertial reference frame means you're only under the effects of inertia. Right. There's no acceleration going Correct. on. Correct. No acceleration. So I'm not holding the brake. I'm not holding the accelerator except to account for drag. But let's assume that we're in a vacuum, somehow not dying. Right. <laughs> right. The idea is that I'm just moving along at a constant, non changing velocity. Um, and as long as that's the case, right, we're both in inertial frames, we should see the same result for measuring some experiment. In this case, measuring the speed of light. So what should that look like? Well, let's talk about our little experimental setup. If I've got a, a detector and a source of photon here at, well, let's just do here. And then up here, I've got a mirror and I shoot out a photon Starting at point A, it travels up, hits point B, and then travels straight back down in the same point C, right? I know that this length here is some amount that I know I'll call it L. Um, the result of that is simply that, you know, the change in my position, which call the x position here, right? I know that delta x will be zero as the same in here, the change in y position and the change in z position. Those should all be zero, right? Because a and c are lined on top of each other. So the only thing that possibly took, you know, a change in value is the amount of time that it took to go from a to c, right? So I know that it travels this distance L twice and at a velocity, the speed of light. So this should be simply distance divided by velocity, right? Which is 2L over C. Easy peasy. In... Yeah. Uh, if I then change the inertial frame that I'm at. Let's say now I'm moving, actually, let me call this, yeah. Uh, now I'm moving perpendicular to the velocity that the light is bound, the direction that the light is bouncing. What is that gonna look like? Well, if now instead of a frame, Why a frame where my inertial reference frame is V or zero. Now I have some big V that I'm moving at. So I'm going to be a new frame of reference, right? X prime in that direction, Y prime in that direction. And it's moving velocity big V in the Y in the positive Y direction, right? Well, what is that going to look like? Well, it's going to look like first I've got. You're going to confuse everybody because X is up and down. And y is I am. Left and right. Should I change that? <laughs> Just so people realize. I had changed. Yeah, I know. I've I've messed with standard notation. I don't know why I did that. It's, it's life. fine. As long as we point it out, people realize. I stuck with a thing. So, uh, the, if if I'm moving with the frame in some velocity v, well, actually, let me say to match up with the diagram that I have. I'm actually moving this direction. Well, what's it gonna look like? Okay, so I've got the 
source detector at point A, right here, and initially there's some the mirror, then instead of moving straight up, because I'm moving in that direction, in this direction over here, right, by the time that the light hits the mirror, it will have shifted the mirror's position that I'll see, and the source will have shifted like this. So it'll look like that. B has hit this point that this this point in space that is not directly above where I saw A, but some amount shifted over because I'm moving. And as I continue back on, right, and detect the final bit, right, as the light bounces back and detects C, okay, I can see now it's going to extend this distance over. So what I can see is that the distance between A and C has now shifted by a distance big V times whatever the time frame it takes to, for the light to go from A to C, delta T prime, I'll call it. All right. Well, let's look at the total distance that this covers. Well, I know that uh, the here, this is simply uh, Pythagorean theorem, right? I know that it's traveled some amount in the x direction and so, or in the x direction and some amount in the y direction. And to find the total distance, all I have to do is multiply by two the one hypotenuse of, you know, this guy. I know this direction is L, and this is half of um, the displacement delta x, right? That we go. So half of V over T squared. Right. T prime. Yeah, uh, delta T prime, excuse me. Right? So the distance I see is twice the. Move that down a little bit. All right, is going the distance that I see is going to be twice the square root of the one distance squared plus v delta t prime half of that, right? Because this is the total distance, so half of that would be where b is, and that has to be squared because of the Pythagorean theorem. And I take twice that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, what is the time and uh, what is what is the time difference, right? The amount of time that it took as far as me and the moving inertial frame sees, well, that again should be which we'll call delta t, that should just be the distance seen divided by the velocity that it was traveling at, right? Which in this case He's is hidden. just c. That equation down there move that up a little bit, which is just this guy divided by C. So 2 divided by C, square root L squared plus V delta T prime over 2 squared. And the square root comes all the way through. And, well, my... For this experiment, my X position... The change in that x position is zero. The change in the z coordinate is zero as well. But the question is, okay, what about this length? I know this length counts, right? This is v delta t prime. Now, an interesting thing is, what? well, what if I consider... In, uh, at the moment I ask myself, okay, the a particular combination of this and this, the non-zero quantities that have changed, if I look at negative, just out of curiosity, negative delta t prime squared plus delta y, I should call it prime squared, 
those are all primes just because they are a different set of x y and z coordinates because i'm in a different frame this is just a note-taking thing in order to make sure that I'm i know sure whether no i'm one referencing one frame now. or another to be fair this is the hardest part of special relativity is keeping track of those little primes yeah <laughs> without without a doubt oh my goodness it's hard uh, if i plug okay the things that i know into here what i'll find is okay this is negative four L squared plus say V delta T prime over two squared. T prime, plus, not squared. Uh, yes, prime. Plus, right, the delta Y prime squared. But delta Y is the same as oh excuse me this is multiplied by four this and this are the same quantity and what i'll know is when i multiply out the four times you know divided by two squared i'll end up with simply minus four l squared which is the same quantity that i would have gotten if i had taken these quantities squared them and added them together in the same way i.e this is equal to minus c delta t without the prime basically the change in here uh time distance effectively that's what c times delta t would give you um, a, a distance measurement the amount that you see changing, right, that combination, would be exactly the same that I end up seeing, as long as I combine them in this correct way. What that means is that that quantity, and, and I didn't give you any particular numbers for what delta T or delta X were, just here, you know, it's gone some distance, some arbitrary amount of time that it takes to go between that distance. What that means is, is that quantity, which here, I'll define for you, this ds squared which is negative c a change in time squared plus your change in x y and z squared this is invariant according to einstein's principle of relativity as long as this quantity is invariant that mean that means that you will have um Oh, we can, we'll build this. How that is how you make sure that both you and I get the same result for our experiment. What we would eventually say, oh, this is how you measure the speed of light, for example. Okay, bring that diagram down. Let's let's unpack that for a second. Yeah. So the very first time, the observer was not moving. Right. Okay. So as far as he's concerned, the amount of distance that the photon moved was just the distance to the mirror and then back. Right. Now, here. If we didn't understand what was going on here, it, we might assume that the photon is moving superluminally as we're moving by because it looks like it's covering this distance and this distance. Right. But what this equation is doing is saying, no, 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 the photon's not actually moving faster than the speed of light. It's just, this is the difference in my perception versus your perception. Right. And here's how we reconcile them. Right. So it, effectively, like, if we start from the assumption that both you and I would see the speed of light being the same value, right? This setup, either way, actually, uh, will give us the correct picture, right? You and Billy, you and your wife sitting and shooting the photon back and forth where she has the mirror in back, mm -hmm. right? You would see that first diagram. Me and my car would see the second diagram because as I'm driving past, the position that Billy has relative to where she started from, in my perspective, changes by the time that the photon reaches her. Right. Right. And by and your position from where you were changes, in my perspective, f compared to where I initially saw you release that photon. But as long as I start from the assumption that uh, the photon moves at the same velocity either way, this is how we reconcile it. Right, makes sense. Um, 
And the quantity that kind of pops up as a new variant in this is that space-time distance, this ds squared, where I take... Lift him up. Yeah. This ds squared boy here. Let us... Important equations. And what we'll notice is this is the typical what's called metric, the way that we assign distances, the way that we would measure distances in that dx squared, dy squared, dz squared, that's just your change in one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions, right? We live what we perceive regularly as a three-dimensional world. And what, special, what, what Einstein says is, well, if I include the distance that I would get by multiplying time by the speed of light and subtract that from that quantity, I get the space-time quantity that is invariant regardless of which inertial frame you're looking at the experiment from. So the idea being, okay, here is a thing that's invariant. Here's the thing that two observers in different inertial frames will agree upon, that this difference in space-time, as we'll call it, is the same for both experiments. Even though, you know, on the outset, they might look different right one versus the other uh, the structure of it clearly looks different so what do i agree they agree upon they agree upon this guy here this difference in space time now you might be wondering okay how is it, it we saw the galilean transform up here right how could it how could mathematically i come up with um some way of creating a transform that still is, allows for, you know, a velocity of something to be the same in all frame, in all frames of reference, in all inertial frames. The answer is, well, okay, it's not too hard. The only thing that I will assume is simply that if I'm changing from the standing still, the regular x, y, z coordinates to some inertial inertia yeah uh, yeah inertial frame that's moving which will be called x prime y prime z prime if it's moving say in the x direction if if the my reference frame is moving in the x direction the way that i can the the, the most basic thing that i can assume is one that the function that i would have to come up with would be linear in your space and time measurements would uh, so the equation that you know i would i would apply to your space and time coordinates to get what i would see in my space and time coordinates in the prime coordinates since space is homogeneous and we assume physics is the same everywhere the thing i get to assume is okay at worst this is a linear equation i.e because there's, there's no acceleration right okay there is some constants gamma and B, that multiply your time and positions that together will give me my position here and time here. Right? And so the question is, okay, how mathematically can I assume, how mathematically can I recover what those constants, those four constants should be. Uh, and we'll argue these straight up from the physical conditions that we want. If, if I uh, set the correct values for gamma and B and A and B, capital A and capital B, uh, what I'll find is that I, can, I could recover the Galilean transforms, right? This absolutely fits the Galilean transforms that we had before, the, what were initially assumed to be the correct classical velocity transforms, position and time transforms. If the one condition that I uh, require is that the my primed coordinates, x prime, should be zero if the velocity, if the time I happen to be looking at an, a, an event, right, you catching the ball, if basically my origin of the frame lines up with you catching the ball, i.e., x equals vt, right? So the 
the position that you catch the ball also happens to line up with my velocity and the time it takes me to travel from some point to where that ball is line up, then x prime should be zero. Okay, so spell that out again. Okay, so x was my position. Mm -hmm. X prime is your position. Mm -hmm. We are trying to... Or Right now, what you said here is that our t's are agreed upon. We have the same t. So, if there's... Let me actually write this out. Okay, so we've got your x and t positions. If... Let's say you see some event here. Okay? If... Actually, let me put it here. So in your uh, frame, you measure this event happens at some regular T and um, some position X away from you. Could be right on you. It could be off. If we, I started moving at the, if my frame of reference started moving at exactly the same time, and let's, let's say you and I start off in exactly the same position and you throw a ball right across the field. If I move with the ball at the same velocity that you throw the ball out, let's assume that you just throw it, that it reaches its maximum velocity. So you're going to share the ball's inertial mm -hmm. frame. I basically travel along with the ball. Okay. Okay. If the, then the time that I see the ball or the position that I see the ball hit the ground should be exactly the same position as my where my origin is because I'm traveling with the ball. So here I'll have x prime, t prime, right? That event of the ball hitting the ground, I should see the ball hit the ground at the origin, at zero, basically at x prime equals zero because I've been traveling along with that ball as it's flying through the air. Okay, so when, and when x equals zero, we're saying it's on the ground. Right. Okay. Right. So what that means is, right, you, that position in your frame of reference would be both x away from you, but it would also be the velocity that you threw the ball at times the time it took for it to hit the ground. Right? And if I travel with the ball, then my frame's velocity is the same as the ball's velocity. So I should still see the ball drop at the origin. Right? Um, okay. So that condition... Is it capsule like this? If if so, one dimensional ball. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> okay, we're physicists. We can we can imagine one dimensional balls. Okay, in theory, uh, you can. I mean, you can extend this to two dimensions easily enough. I'm just making my life easier. Okay, right. I'm making not only my life. I'm making the poor audience that has to keep up with all of this <laughs> on the screen. I'm keeping their lives easy too. So you to be clear, when you're using the summation of the time component and the full distance component, then you're going to write it as S. Mm -hmm. But when we're just talking about individual coordinates, then we're just going to say X. Right. Okay. When, when I'm talking about a metric of space time, um, which is basically what would end up being distances in this kind of diagram, mm -hmm. that's what we're going to call S. But I can look at individual coordinates Right of the thing that makes up a distance. T, right? X, Y, or Z. Same. Right. Okay. Same thing. Like if you you know you you're measuring how far does the ball fly. I don't pay attention to how up and down you threw the ball. I just measure along in one distance. So even though the total distance that the ball traveled in like normal Newtonian physics would be the combination of the x distance that it goes plus the y distance up and down that it goes, I would just pay attention to its to its distance along in one of those directions. Right. Right. So this condition tells me, oh, OK, in order for that to be zero when X is equal to VT, I should have X prime equal to zero equal to gamma X. Your X is VT plus, of course, BT. I can use this to eliminate and isolate B and see that it should be negative gamma V. OK. So I know what B is. The question now is, how do I find what gamma is? Okay. Uh, that's 
pretty much easy because according to relativity, there's no privileged uh, Galilean frame of reference, no privileged inertial frame of reference. So if I take the inverse transformation, right, I'm coming the opposite direction, uh, the position that should be seen in that opposite direction should be like if you were viewing, if you were moving, if instead of the ball being um, shot, instead of me in my reference frame following along with the ball, in your reference frame, if you throw it, it looks like the ball is moving away from you at the opposite velocity that I'm moving at, right? So basically what that means is you would see the ball landing as a combination of the measurements that I see like this. It would be gamma. Well, it would be, yeah, gamma x prime minus minus v. Now, right. say this again. What Actually, so let me, before we, sorry, let's go real quickly back. So once I plug this into this guy, what I find is, okay, x prime is equal to gamma times x minus v t. So me moving along, me in a reference frame that's moving along with the ball, the position that I see the ball fall at and hit the ground will be this currently unknown constant gamma times x minus the velocity that I'm moving at relative to your frame and the time that it takes to get there. So we can say that due to the principle of relativity, the, tra the form of the transform that you would take my coordinates and then, tr uh, you know, do this math on them to figure out what it, what the ball hitting the ground like would look like in your frame is simply if you plugged this formula in, but with an opposite velocity, i.e. X should be equal to some gamma X prime minus V prime T prime. Right. Okay. So X is where, X is going to be the displacement of the ball mm -hmm. once it's reached its terminal distance right. from me. Right. And what you're saying here is that, okay, VT, which is essentially a distance, you know, velocity times time. Right. You're saying, okay, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to assume that I'm moving in the opposite direction the exact same amount of distance in the exact same amount of time so we can just cancel the two out. If I wanted to, so we could look at it, okay, I'm traveling along with the ball. And I go, okay, from your perspective, from the measurements of you looking at where the ball would fall, where do I calculate the ball would fall as long as I'm moving in this reference frame? But you could also invert that. You could say, okay, from the perspective of the ball, when the ball lands, how far away are you? How, what, would the, what would the ball calculate how far you are away if it knew your measurements for where the ball fell? All right, so it's, so, you know, you're looking at, your perspective, you're looking at how does the ball, what's the distance between <laughs> the ball? Relativity, man. Oh, this is, ah. <laughs> right? Where does the ball fall relative to you? But the ball could be saying, where do you fall relative to the ball? Right? I can go in one direction or the other. And basically, the, the form of the equation is exactly the same. I just changed where the prime and the, um, the unprime coordinates are between this equation and this equation. But okay. the principle of relativity comes in and says, well, if the only difference between these two is the fact that in one frame, you know, it's moving at velocity V, then V prime should simply be negative V, right? So the, the speed that you, that you see the ball's frame moving away from you should just be opposite the frame that the, the ball sees your frame moving away from it. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I plug that into this and I say, okay, X is equal to gamma X prime minus minus V T prime. There we go. So, aha, I've done it, right? This then easily simplifies. Bring him up. 
There we go. Yeah, this just easily simplifies into x prime plus v. Let's move that over there. <laughs> Make it a little more coherent. So, well, what does that mean? Uh, let's say that the th ball that we're throwing back and forth is a light signal, and we're travel you're traveling along, you know, the different frames of reference are traveling along with that photon. Uh, this will make the math easier because what we get to say is okay um, what we get to say is okay the time that t the time in one reference frame time t is just going to be the x distance that c is divided by c and the other frame we'll see okay t prime is simply the distance it sees x prime divided by c uh, so I plug those into the appropriate equation, and I find that I will have x prime is gamma 1 minus v over c. All right, the reference frame. This looks very familiar. Oh, it should. Getting into Lorentz. This is exactly what we're showing the derivation of. Now, what I can do is I can multiply these two equations together. Absolutely fine, right? And what I get on one side is that x prime x should be equal to gamma squared 1 minus v squared c squared gamma prime x prime. Hey! I can just divide out the x prime, the x x prime, and what I find from that is that gamma must equal 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared c squared, i.e. the velocity that the reference frame is moving adjusts the coordinate that I'll see by this Lorentz factor as a ratio of the velocity of light. Um, so basically that gamma tells us how important the velocity is right to the deformation that we would that we're going to observe or have to account for we'll find that all we know is that you know how i'll measure where something where a ball lands while falling and where how you'll measure a ball where it lands uh is according to this equation basically that x prime is equal to one over square root one minus v squared c squared times let me make sure i'm getting this right yeah uh, x minus vt so this is this is what i i would take your data that you measured and then plug it into this formula and say oh this is what i will see kind of thing um, but that gamma is really important. That gamma does end up being very useful. Um, now, if I make the opposite substitution, right, basically taking these guys and replacing instead of t, I replace x, i.e., I say that x should be equal to c times t and x prime should be equal to c times t prime. I can plug those into the Lorentz equations. I will find that c t prime is equal to gamma c t minus v over c x. And then I associate, right, I can divide by C on both sides of this equation. And what that gives me is C squared. But I also know it has to be true from the general coordinates that I said before that T prime has to be some, oops, that should be an X there, uh, T prime should be some A times X plus 
B times T. And what I'll find is that, oh, okay, equating these two equations tells me A is equal to negative gamma V over C squared, and capital B is going to be simply gamma, i.e. T prime is negative gamma V over C squared times your positions X plus a gamma factor times the T that you see. All right? What I'll find is if I take the derivatives of this, uh, of those two transforms, specifically, if I look at, okay, what velocities will I see in the prime in the X direction, i.e., what is the derivative of the X prime coordinates with respect to T prime? It will give me that it is the velocity that uh, you see the event happening, i.e. the speed of the ball, minus the reference frame that it's, the, re the, the speed of the reference frame, the speed that I'm moving at in my inertial reference frame, minus the multiplication of the event's uh, x direction, my reference frame speed, and c squared. Did you just write v times v squared? No, V times V in the X direction. Or, Here? or V to the X power? Uh, yeah, this is, let me put parentheses. This is just the X component of the velocity. Oh, okay. All right. Um, now. <laughs> okay, most people would expect that X to be on the bottom. Uh, That's a subscript. A strange bit of notation from, okay, from, right. the, from the book that I'm stealing this from. Beautiful hurdle. Okay, so just so we're clear, people, he meant v sub x. Yeah. Now, if I set... Not v to the x power. Or, in this case, this would be actually v to the x derivative, because that's also a thing that shows up in calculus books. Okay. Yeah, parentheses in. Nah. This if is... I set that velocity that you're, you're like, you know, the, the velocity of the ball moving, if I set that equal to c, then the velocity that I'll see that... Oh, I did do sub x here. Yeah, let's just, let's be consistent, you're right. Yeah. It's mixing on me. And it's not a prime, is it, up above? It is not. Okay. The only prime should be that guy there. All right, so the velocity that that will see if I know, you know, if we input this into here is... Now, what, what is the distinction now? If, if we're saying velocity and velocity sub x, what, what is the distinction between those two? Sorry, so the speed of the ball is the big V x, right? The speed of the ball in the x direction. And I'm and then is little v, v is the velocity that my reference frame is moving oh, in. Oh, that's a little v. Yeah, a little v. And then I'll see the velocity, <laughs> the velocity of the ball that I would see right, is related to the velocity that you would see okay. mixed with, in this way, the velocity that I'm actually moving at. So velocity sub b for Ben <laughs> yes. is a little v. Yes. All right, and then well, yeah. big so this v is, sub x is the velocity of the ball. That's the reference frame. This is there we, yeah, there we go. the speed BF. that I would see in the ball. Yeah, this yeah. is the speed that uh, okay. this is the speed you would see the ball moving this is the speed i and my reference frame moving at v sub f frame velocity would see if i plug if that ball is instead of photon moving at the speed of light well okay this is equal to c right same here c so this would be 1 minus vf vf c over c squared right and what why did you set the velocity of the ball? Well, because it's a photon. Let's it's see. a photon. Let's say right, it is right. a photon. Right. Well, minor little bit of algebra will really quickly show me, oh, the velocity that I see the photon moving at is also C. So basically, these, this transform, this Lorentz transforms, ensures that no matter what inertia, velocity of the inertial reference frame that I'm in, I'm moving at, no matter what that value is, the velocity of the photon I see is the speed of light C. So you're saying if I take a running start and toss a photon at you, that photon we're both going to agree is only going to move at the speed of light. Right. Right. And so the, uh, I, I think it's a useful thing is that this, the thing that ensures that is this transform between 
the velocities that, that the positions that you would see to the position that I would see the way that it combines here ensures that we both agree on what the speed of a photon is. Right. An important point. Or rather, kablamo. So, let's uh, go back to our friend ds squared. Uh, there are a couple of important things. Uh, if it is greater than zero, this is what we call space-like separated. If that distance is equal to zero, it is um, light-like. And if you bring the equation for it back, it'll make sense because you'll see there's t versus the uh, right. displacement fighting each other in the equation. This is less than zero. This is time-like. Right. And of course, you can have right, right. a different amount of signs. You can either have these guys being the biggest quantity or this guy being the biggest quantity, or they can balance out exactly if you're moving, basically. If the distance that you're measuring is exactly the distance away that it would take the photon to travel, right? In that, in a particular amount of time. Because that's one of the fun bits here is now, instead of looking at just where do, you know, a ball, where does a ball drop after I've thrown it and paying attention to the position, I now inc incorporate both the ball dropping and the time that it takes for the ball to leave my hand and reach the ground. So what I've done is instead of saying, oh, okay, okay, T zero, we assume in our natural Newtonian way that T zero is where we begin. And then some other time T it'll land on the ground and I'll measure that, but like, it'll be kind of a background thing. It's like, no, instead what we are here paying attention to is the, time space difference the ds difference between two events the ball leaving your hand as you throw it and when the ball hits the ground right and so the distance between those two events in space time will follow this formula and if you pay attention to that fo that formula that distance in space time that's this invariant quantity that everyone will agree upon so we should base our physics on keeping this guy uh, at the center of it it's this space time Okay, so just summarizing this up, if if we had the crude ball example, remember where I was saying that it could, to a naive observer, it could look like that photon is moving faster than the speed of light because it's covering more distance when you're moving. What this equation does is says, okay, fine, that's what you think the distance was, but you got to take into account the time, and right. I have to use the same equation where I'm going to have different values for those things, but the final result that ds squared is going to be the same for both of us. Right. And that quantity is actually the displacement of an event, not just in a position, but also in time. Right. Okay. Right. Um, a, a thing that we've talked about because of that, is that disagreement between in blanket ways where you and I would see things happening both in space and in time uh, is something that, is is uh we, we've talked about the simultaneity being broken so let's say that you and billy both throw balls towards each other at exactly the same time from your perspective your inertial frame of not not moving at all with respect to each other what i'll see is if i'm coming across i will not see the events of you and billy uh throwing the ball at the same time in my coordinate system, right? I would see if I'm moving, you know, from you to her, I would see you throwing the ball first, I believe, and then her throwing the ball. But what we'll both agree upon is if I mapped out. Right? And to be clear, that's if you're moving extremely fast. Yes. Where you as a human would perceive an actual difference between our throw times. Right. Yeah. So not, not normal speeds. No, 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 no. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to there. Okay. Right. If I... Let's make a space-time diagram, because this is probably the best way to talk about it. We have X, we have T, we have Rob throws his ball, we have Billy throws her ball. So in your reference frame, V is not moving, this is what you would see. They're along, they're along a point, the same point in your time frame. But what I would see 
in my reference frame, moving with a slight change in velocity, x prime, t prime, is that I would see, let's say, Rob throws the ball, and then a little bit later, Billy throws the ball. So, right, my, the time that I would say you throw the ball and she throws the ball don't agree. But the thing that we will agree upon is the distance between those two dots. Right. The length of that red line. Now, I've drawn this terribly, but we would both agree. We're go and, and that is true no matter how I change, no matter how I set the velocity that this reference frame is moving at. That length stays the same. As long as I define, you know, the metric of the space I'm measuring that length with according to this formula, ds squared. And so that's why ds is so important. Um, they are, it's, it's an invariant quantity, and physics loves its invariant quantities. And classic Newtonian uh, uh, mechanics, right, we like energy because it's an invariant quantity as long as nothing outside the system you right. know, Can't comes be in and interrupts your dynamics, right? Right. All right, so this here, what I have drawn out, is a space-like separated event. Right, this here, because my ds is going to be greater than zero. No matter how you transform this, you will never get these um, points oriented in a way that gives a negative ds. Now, philosophically, what this means is that the f um, you and Billy throwing the ball to each other at the same t at the same time in your reference frame is something that you know you throwing the ball can't actually affect her throwing the ball. So in your reference frame, the fact that you threw it at the same time uh, is kind of a coincidence, right? Um, if I, as I shift, let's see, as I shift the, the, refer the speed of the reference frame you look at that event, you'll never get it so that it would be like you throw the ball and say, hey, throw the, that you throw the ball, and in response, Billy sees you throw the ball and then throws it back to you, right? That would be the case where DS is actually negative. There's a time-like separation between those two events. And what that means is that it's possible for your throwing the ball to causally affect when she throws the ball. So that event of okay. you throwing the ball affects. So why, okay, why are we saying that me throwing the ball doesn't affect Billy throwing the ball? Is this just a claim that you're you're or an assumption that we have to work with? It's if granted because uh, it, when you think of this thought experiment, it's it's uh, on close positions, so it's kind of hard. Imagine you're on two separate planets, right, right. far away from each where, other, where the speed of light is such that there's actually a delay, right? Okay, then in your reference frame, right. If you run the experiment where you both throw the ball and she tells you in her reference frame, which relative to you is not moving, so you're in, let's say, the same reference frame somehow. Um, yeah. Uh, the time delay that it would, if the time delay that it takes between you throwing the ball and her receiving it and her throwing the ball and you receiving her ball, if those two time measurements agree, that's actually by coincidence. Because if you threw the, uh, um, yeah, it, that the, that is by coincidence in the sense that if she would have, if she had waited until she could tell you through the ball, then the space time difference between when you throw the ball and when she throws her ball in response would not be space like separated. It would be time like separated, which would look something more like her throwing the ball here as opposed to here. Okay, so we're just just to clarify and summarize. So we're saying that if it's space like separated, then we're such a distance apart that two events is, cannot be correlated. Right. Exactly. So like or or it's a coincidence that they're correlated. Not yeah, they can't be. Even if we send an atomic clock and this atomic clock is synchronized, just the fact that we've moved the atomic clock has already put them out of sync. 
Are we, are we not even taking that into account? No. Uh, okay, so let, let's set it up. You guys both have an atomic clock that somehow, at the right moment, you, you believe you've got it lined up so that they are clicking at the same time. When you guys both agree that, okay, when the clock hits three, we both throw. Mm-hmm. Okay? When, she throw, when you both throw the ball at each other, you cannot be sure that the other person has thrown the ball at that time. Because, looking out over at the other planet, it would take some amount of time for the light, for the photons bouncing off the ball, to reach your eyes. Well, if, you're throw, if, the, spa- if the separation is great enough uh, in space, then, y- the f- then photons from her ball couldn't possibly reach you before you had a chance to throw your ball when the clock struck three on both. Does that make sense? That's what space-like separation means. Okay. So if you throw the ball at the very moment you see Billy throwing the ball. I threw it too late. You threw it too late. And that would be, that would correspond to here where you've got time-like separation. If in your reference frame, it turns out that you had thrown the balls at the same time, that's space-like separation, and you guys could not have thrown the ball at the same time in response to the other one throwing the ball. So, you know, here, back and forth, you and I can hold a ball, like toss back and forth the ball, and make it look like when I see you throw the ball, I throw the ball at the exact same time. In actuality, that's not happening. We're not throwing the ball at the same time. Right. There's an infinitesimal difference in the amount of time that you would say you threw the ball in the amount the time that I would say I threw the ball. So it's impossible for this event that you're describing, even if we were standing right in front of each other's face, to ever be time like separated. Okay. Um. Well, uh, if if we truly threw it at exactly the same moment, what we would do is we would actually have that time like separation. I would see you throwing the ball and then throw my ball in response, but because we're so close, it almost looks like it's it's both time and space like separated right it it what's the right way to put this that difference in time that you would say you threw the ball and the difference in time that I, compared to when i said we both threw the ball would be so small as to be zero but if you have you know planet size distances that distant that ch- that difference in when we report when did i throw the ball uh, would be significant. Would be you know. Okay. Seconds, so minutes, over et planetary distance, it's going to be a space like over uh, personal bubble size distances. It's going to be light like, or is it time like, or is or what does it appear? Sorry. So truly simultaneous events are always space like, but when the distance is so close, it will look like it's possible and and. When you have space-like separated events, it is impossible for those two events to influence each other. Basically, you can't um, throw the ball in response to me throwing the ball, and I can't, and vice versa. We can't be sure that we've lined up the throwing of the ball at the same time. Okay. Okay? In closed space, it can, it can look like that I can watch you and throw the ball at the same time. So it looks like they're causally related. It can, uh, so it can look like it's causally related while still being space-like separated, but actually it would still be time-like, right? Uh, it's just that infinitesimal difference is... It would appear to be time-like, but we know it's still space-like. Right. Is what you're saying. Right. Okay, so time-like means that you could have two events occur... What? What does that mean exactly then? Effectively in response to that you can have that the... That event A is the reason that event B happens. That me throwing the ball is caused by you throwing the ball. Okay, but why wouldn't that also be the case if I just sit on Mars and wait for the light to hit me and then I throw it? That, well, no, that is possible. You would, But then those events would be time-like separated, not space-like separated. Okay. So that's... So that's it's possible to have both time and space-like All separated right. events... In no matter what context, no matter whether it's planetary separation or whether it's you and me right here. So there's 
there's no causal relationship between space-like separated events. Right. But there is a there could be a causal relationship between time-like separated right. events. Okay. Yes. Yes. All right. And what's interesting is when you have um, space-like separated events, depending on the reference frame you have, they can look simultaneous or not. That's an important point. So you and Billy throwing balls interplanetarily, if you happen to, in your reference frame, line it up so that it looks like it's simultaneous for you two, me moving at a, in an inertial frame you know, between the planets will actually, again, see you throwing first and then her throwing second. Not in a way that it could be causally related, but still it's not simultaneous. That simultaneity is lost. Okay, so you will never, as an observer, between two space-like events, space-like separated events, will never be able to come to the conclusion that they were causal. Yes. Even as a separate observer. Exactly. Because there's no speed that you could be moving that will suddenly reverse the order. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. Whereas, you know, the... <laughs> Yes. Lots, lots of little tiny gotchas. Spatial, spatial, special relativity is the worst, mainly because we can actually deal with the stuff enough to like try and attach to it, and it's it's ugh. Uh, what this actually kind of um, leads to. Well, let's just kind of pop up here so I have a nice space to work with. Um, is that? And now instead of T, I'll say CT because this is now a distance. It's the same thing. Is if I have some event P, right? You throw the ball or whatever. There's what we call a light cone. Basically, light emitted backwards in time in the past or forwards in time in the future separates out the regions of the diagram, right? Over a point, say, A here. Actually, let's move it over here, right? The DS that I would see would be negative. This is a time-like separation. So it's possible that event A is caused by event P. Or it could be, say, event C. It could be, if I have event C, in this light cone, it could be that C caused P. But if I have event P, or no, not P, B out here, this is space-like separated from P. And so no matter what reference frame I look at, it is impossible for B to have caused P. Because the space-like separation between them, or excuse me, the time-space separation between them will be positive. Oh, okay. From the point of view of B to P is what yes. you're saying. Not from the point of view of P to B. Right. Okay. Well, either... Yeah, yeah. yeah. From B to P. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, do this DS. There it is. There's delta, so let's be consistent. Delta S is less than zero. Delta S is less than zero. And if I had some point... Well, okay. They can't both be less than zero unless we're saying from the point of view of... Can you put arrows in the line to indicate from whose point of view? Because you've got C and A. Now we're both... You're saying both of them are less than zero. Yeah. Uh, you, you're looking at the distance in this direction and in this direction. Okay. So we're going positive T. Right. Up. Oh, so okay. this distance in this in this direction is greater than zero. The distance in this direction is less than zero. The distance in from here to here is less than zero. We always move the time. For some reason, it, it just threw you for a loop. Yeah. Well, no. Now I'm thrown for a loop. I I'm having a hard time reconciling how you said that originally A and P are space like separated, right? No, no, no. A and P are time-like separated. Or time-like separated. B and P are space-like. Everything within this cone, so... Could be causally related. Yes, could right. be. 
They are they, because uh, they are time like okay. separate. I, I must have misheard you when you first drew it. Okay, all right. It's possible I misspoke. That is uh, a thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's something humans are known to do. Um, yeah. And so if I collect, for example, all, if I know a particle was here, I can talk about this, a, a world line. Basically, the part, the position of the particle in space and time could be something like this. And we call this a world line, right? This would be the function that tracks where a particle that I know you know, at this exact moment in time, how it would evolve, you know, in the past or in the future, All right? Basically setting T equals zero or T is the present. Assuming things are deterministic. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Assuming that we can follow the point exactly like that. Hey, look, a, a, con a conflict with quantum mechanics. It begins even from special relativity. Sort of. You can reconcile special relativity and, um, quantum mechanics we'll get to a can't later but as long as you have flat metrics it's great so uh this is effectively a curve in a 2d space and so what i can talk about is if you know its position i'm interested in its position as a function of time well i'll parameterize it not by the time on this axis but what i will call uh tau Tau is simply, or rather, let's give it in differential form. That's the easiest way. Let me write it properly. Tau squared, right? D tau squared is simply ds squared, the negative of it, divided by c squared. What is that? We call this proper time. And we call it proper time because it's what a clock traveling along that white line would measure. Okay. Right. It's the. Well, we'll see uh, if if I want to know, let's say I've got. Let me erase these. No, well, I can. Now, just to be clear, then. So when we're drawing this um, diagram right here and we have this axis marked as T, whose T is that? The lowercase T. That's the time that would be seen in some reference frame. So the proper time and the time that you see in a reference frame don't have to agree. Right. Right. Um, but the, this T here is an arbitrarily chosen it's, reference frames T. Right. Okay. Arbitrarily chosen reference frames T. Okay. Correct. This is, this is, we've picked some reference frame that we are doing our physics from. Here's what we will measure as our time, lowercase t. And what the particle that we're studying will measure at it, as its time is something call, we'll call tau, this proper time. And they don't have to agree. They might agree. They don't have to. So what is the, um, what is that? Actually, let's, let's look at that. So let's say I have um, two events, alpha and beta, and I want to know what is the time difference, the the proper time between those two um, events time. right alpha and beta well that's simply going to be an integral from alpha to beta of that differential tau right well i know this definition here i know what ds is in terms of my um, space-time boy and what I can say is, and if like this formula here is the general formula that calculus tells us that we can find for any line that I draw on here, a 2D surface, but any, you know, any line in any geometry that come up. As long as I know what this differential bit is in terms of the coordinates that I have, I can calculate what that difference should be by calculating this integral. Anyone who's taken, I think, third semester calculus introduces this. The next one being vector calculus really got, kind of goes into it. Although, sadly, at USF, they didn't require you to take vector calculus. No, they had no math prereqs. It was ridiculous. It's, uh, such a shame. Like, a lot makes more sense once you take it. I mean, only the bit. calculus, but there, there was no linear algebra. Or... Right. Yeah. Um, okay, so I know what this is. So the square root, when I take that, I can just say, okay, this is just dt squared minus dx squared y squared dz 
d squared, right? And then I take the bracket and I take the square root of that, right? Because uh, I know that ds squared, that formula told me it was all in terms of these things squared, so I take the square root to get just dt by itself. Here, I will reference this as d vector squared, dx vector squared to make the writing better. Well, what is the squiggly line? And then you stuck something over it? Should that have been a little... So what I'm saying is that everything under the squiggly line, I'm now going to reference as this thing. So basically what I'm saying is, okay. Because it looks like divided by... Yeah. This is... dt squared minus dx vector squared okay one half and dx basically dx vector can be any dimension that you want it can be the one dimensional case like here or you know you can go up to the 3d and right it's just uh the uh addition of those three of like the three dimensions that yeah. you would have squared x is all. gone from the x position to representing the displacement which could be x y and z right just to this is common <laughs> make it easier for yeah. writing now what i can do is i can pull out a factor of dt from this uh term here right and what that would mean is that this is alpha beta dt squared square rooted is just dt times one minus That should all be divided by c squared because of this c squared up here. My bad. Anyways, uh, 1 minus 1 over bad habit. Bad habit. 1 over c squared dx dt squared square rooted. And anyone who's done line integrals will, f will uh, recognize this pretty readily. Well, I can just define this as my velocity squared as a function of t, right? Right. So most compactly, what I will say is that the proper time that I'll find between alpha and beta... And when you say my velocity, you mean the velocity of the clock? Uh, yeah, what ends up being the velocity of the reference frame itself that follows the clock yeah yeah yes yes okay yeah because because the uh uppercase t i forgot what you call that the uh tau tau well, well tau but what, what was tau again what proper time proper time so the proper time is that's going to be the time ticked by a clock in the reference frame. And now V is the velocity moved by that reference frame. Correct? The velocity of that reference frame. Right. Dis positional velocity. Right. Okay. It would be the, the velocity of that particle moving through your um, frame. Yes. Okay. Right. Which in effect would be the velocity of the reference frame because you know right 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 because we're yeah. tau is what the clock on the particle would measure so you seeing the particle move it's like your reference frame is moving relative to that particle yeah yeah complicated to talk about it's terrible <laughs> as long as we're clear i think people will be able to follow yeah uh what that means is is that oh okay i can have this differential element in general d tau is equal to some time the the d time that would be me measured in a reference frame but then multiplied by one minus the speed of that reference frame squared divided by c squared so what that means is that since this quantity is always less than one right because it's a minus sign in there the proper time is always going to be shorter than the time shorter or equal to the time measured in a reference frame. So basically, proper time is the shortest uh, time that an event, the the shortest 
time that a, dis, a difference between events can give you. Make sense? So, meaning it's of all possible observations or reference frames, inertial reference frames, it will be the one that has the lowest value. Correct. Okay. So, if as long as I change my velocity, my reference, the velocity of the reference frame I'm in while measuring the distance between two um, events, I will measure a time between those two events that is greater than what the proper time is. Okay. Makes sense. Which we actually already kind of knew, because the proper time is the time that you would measure if you set your reference frame in a way that the distance between two events is just straight up and down. Okay. The smallest amount of time that you would see. And when you let your reference frame move, that extends that line that you would actually see the the time component of those two events you would see that extend right yeah I believe it's crazy if i'm wrong well i got it. it's the opposite way but uh, correct me in the comics true uh, in the comments true science people um so uh, what that means is that uh, the time difference between events can actually change right you the the amount of time that you would that you would say throwing the ball and the ball hitting the ground is going to be different than the amount of time that i would than i would report seeing it moving across in the car incredible additionally can you hear that now i can i think that's yeah it's yeah you've got your cable wrapped around yeah that's my bad here we go. I think that should fix it. Yep. There we go. That should be fine. Anyways. Uh, so, an important point. This isn't the only... Yep, we're good. This, that happened before when you were uh, looking at it and questioning. Mm, same thing. Okay. My bad with the laptop. It's just... It's cord. Your it's... laptop's power supply is terrible. What do you want from me? <laughs> um... Another thing we can consider is the fact that, say you're looking at a rod in space. Well, that rod, the length of that rod, that rod, its two ends are two time space events of the left end of the rod is here and is here at this moment and the right side of the rod is here at this moment at this exact same moment right well if i have a reference frame that comes through and changes velocity what i'm going to see right if i have some velocity v as we saw before that shifts Time space events upward. It's probably too much. Something like this. Well, what am I going to measure for the x component? Well, if I use my formula for separations in space time, right? If I know that you're moving at some velocity c, this gives. And, and the length of the rod is the distance between those two space-time events. Well, what that means is that, okay, else uh, the length that I would see here, and let's call this a star for baseline, is going to be equal to the length that the slow person would measure minus C and... Delta T, the time that it would take for me to make this measurement to see, you know, photons from here traveling and reaching my eyes effectively. Well, I know the T line should be zero, or the T prime line should be zero. So the transforms give me that T has to be, if that new reference frame 
uh, v over c squared x, which means delta t b v over c l l x prime, right? Because that's its distance here. Okay, so I plug that into here. This gives me if I and then pull out the factor of l squared. That gives me that this is one minus c squared over c squared, right? I.e., the length I see is the length a still reference frame would see times a square root one minus b squared over c squared. And again, this is less than unity, which means that the length of something, the distance. The, fit, the space difference between two things, uh, two events, like the rod existing at two different points in space time at the same, at the particular moment, shrinks when I move from a still reference frame into a moving reference frame. So, so what you're saying is the rod will never appear longer right. than the actual length of the rod? Right. But time? It, it could appear shorter. Right. Okay. So time will, in order to make sure that we both agree on what the speed of light is. Time will expand, time will extend, dilate and between reference frames, and space will contract. So what would be, you know, position the, di the distance between position one and position two will shrink when you change from one reference frame to another. Right? Granted, it, it, potentially could extend but it will never be it will never be greater than how it would look if you're sitting still relative to that object basically the reference frame that makes the two ends of the rod existing being simultaneous events <laughs> to use okay. fancy language there. so again just so we're, we're clear the rod will never appear longer than it actually is right if i'm whizzing by it right Okay. If you're sitting, if you're sitting right next to this pencil, you'll see it at that length. But if someone's driving past it in a car, they will see this pen is shorter than that. Right. But there's no speed that'll make it look longer. Just like how kind of in time, it's the opposite case where, you know, I see a ball the the time that it takes for you to throw the ball and see it hit the ground will never be any shorter than what you would see, no matter how fast I'm moving past you. Right. Right. Now, this has some interesting consequences on how reality works. And we kind of we'll see that in two ways. First off, Uh, first off, we have the well-known uh, paradox called the twin paradox. So let's set up. You've got, we've got Earth, and we got twins, Alice and Bob. So we got Bob, and we have Alice in her spaceship. the best of SpaceX design. We have Alice in her spaceship traveling off to some distant star, which we'll say is actually pretty darn close at about four light years away, which is about distance to Alpha Centauri, right? Like three or something, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's that's a little under closest. 4, right, Bill, for the closest one? Uh 4.26 light years for Proxima Centauri. For Proxima? Okay. Hey, look, I can remember that number. And let's say that she's going about 4 fifths the speed of light. So what we'll assume is that they both start off at Earth at the same point. They both age to the same point. Then she goes in a rocket that accelerates to its speed very quickly, to its max speed goes to Alpha Centauri or some slightly closer star 
What is that doohickey under the four? Light years. L Y. This? You've got oh. four over doohickey. Bad C. handwriting. That's what that is. Four fifths. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Get this thing to have that paper feel. Yeah, I will. It's, I, I've been working on better handwriting. It's just so hard on a slippery iPad. Let me tell you. I don't know, man. <laughs> we'll get or pretty soon, actually. The M1s are shipping in uh, July. Hell yeah. All right. So, uh, what is going to happen? Uh, okay. Well, from Bob's perspective, the... The total distance, right, is going to be eight light years. She's moving at four fifths. So that's going to be ten, a 10 light year journey back and forth. So I mean, you get there and just turn right around. A 10 year journey? 10 year journey overall. Okay. Right. So what you can do is calculate, okay, he's going to go, okay, how, what will um, Alice's point of view see? Well, simple. You take the total time and you look at the um, dilation from her perspective. Okay. Right. From her perspective... Un unplug the laptop. It's still doing it. If I unplug it, the thing will die. Okay, so you, you have to unhook it from... It, it can't go this way. The power cable has to go across the table. Oh, okay. Because it's being picked up in through your headphones and then coming in through here. There you go. Easy enough. Okay, so, yeah. Uh, Alice is... From Bob's perspective, um, he will calculate that, oh, okay, the time I see her take is 10 years. And then say, okay, from her perspective, her proper time will simply be at time times gamma, which for four-fifths the speed of light equals a factor of about 0.6 times 10 which is just six years. So he'll see, hey, Alice calculates that from time, or Bob calculates from time dilation that Alice will see the journey in her perspective taking six years. So he gets the correct result. From Alice's perspective, what she'll know is that since she's, since in her reference frame, she's sitting still, but, uh, or excuse me, she's moving at a particular velocity, she sees the distance between Earth and Alpha Centauri contract down to down by a fact by that um, same factor, that same factor of gamma, where true distance, the distance that she'll see is distance E C is divided by uh, by gamma, which will give that instead of being four light years, is actually oh, excuse me, it should be. Not divided by, it should be multiplied by, decreases it. Gamma. This will give 2.4 light years distance. And then you double that because, you know, that's the distance back there and then back. That'll give you a distance of about three years or a time of three years to travel both ways. So she gets the correct result that, okay, it'll take six years overall for me to reach there. The paradox comes from the idea of saying, well, okay, uh, principle of relativity. Why don't we just take Alice's perspective and say it looks like Bob is moving away from her at that velocity and then coming back towards her at that same opposite velocity? Just like how basically in Bob's, in Bob's view, right, it'll look like she goes out and then comes back in, right? Why can't we do the same? Uh, and just to be clear, it's taking her 10 years from Bob's point of view? Yes. From Bob's point of view, it takes 10 years. Let's see. And from her point of view, it's taking six years? It's taking six years. They both calculate that. So Bob sees her leaving... And then her uh, arriving at that. Uh, so she goes, uh, let's do, 
she goes out to the star and then travels back in. Well, and hold on a second. It from her point of view, it would still be ten years, right? Her her clock would tick. The thing that's different is that from her point of view, there is a Lorentz contraction right. in the distance. So her clock moves at normal speed. It doesn't, her clock doesn't dilate, but the space contracts. Right. right. And really that's the um, thing that contracts it because you think, oh, okay, I can say, you know, you got these twins, one of them moves away and the other one stays still and then comes back. But why, from this guy's perspective, it would look like the opposite. Why then is there an asymmetry in how they age? Now, the, it's not... You just gave con- away the punchline. It's a paradox, but it's not a contradiction because relativity says, hey, no, 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 this is exactly fine. It's just instead of talking about it, you should write down the world lines. So Alice's journey looks like this. She goes up to Alpha Centauri and then comes back, right? Bob's journey in space-time is just from event A to event B like that, straight up. Okay. Now, the way um, uh, frames of reference work is they basically take the coordinate axes that you have and squeeze them together. So, in essence, if I have a new frame of reference, the points that I would associate as simultaneous, right, and this reference frame, for example, would just be straight lines out, right? Like this. From Alice's initial reference frame, uh, at some velocity, they would be angled. So kind of like this, okay? Until she makes her return journey, and they take the opposite angle. And what are those lines again? These are the points of simultaneity from the reference, the outward reference frame for the cyan and the uh, coming back reference frame for the green. So th- there are points in time where Bob and Alice agree? Effectively. They, they are... That their clocks would be the same, would show the same times? Yeah. Uh, not necessarily the same time. It's, it's a correlation of events that, right... Uh, Alice would say are simultaneous in her reference frame. So, for example, along this line, Alice would say this point for Bob and this point for her are happening at the same time. Whereas for Bob, because he's in, we're, we're looking at this from Bob's perspective, he would say these two points oh, okay. are simultaneous. So these are Alice's lines. Right. Okay. The, the, these are the lines that uh, would be... If you shifted to Alice's frame of reference, the cyan lines would be flat and Bob's would be kind of more splayed out. But because we're sticking with Bob's reference frame. And so the they're old... Alice's lines from Bob's point of view. Correct. Okay. There we go. Yes. All right. At different, at different uh, points as the coordinate, as the inertial reference frame moves, the origin of that, of Alice's reference frame moves. And this actually is a resolution because you would think, oh, they would disagree. But if you use your... Time frame, you can say, oh no, look at this time here. This is the amount of time that Bob has that isn't one to one correlated on this strong diagram here, that isn't correlated with any time for Alice. Now here it's it's really um strong and the time that Bob has that Alice doesn't kind of appears discontinuously right it's it's there there's no there's a bunch of time that would all have to be correlated to this point for her that only happens because we've kind of chosen this this right angle transfer in reference frames for alice basically if she could instantly uh change from going towards the planet to away if i make a more realistic oh, they'd be curved yeah right, right if i make something more realistic instead of her journey there being, well, let's just get rid of all of this. Right. We have this. Something more realistic would be 
something like that. Well, then you would have to, instead of having, you know, just the straight diagonal lines, you would have here, they would be correlating, and then it would sweep out. Yeah. Man, I'm bad at drawing. <laughs> More, I'm just trying to draw something in too close a space. Let's say we zoom in. We've got here some kind of right. The lines would slowly shift. And so, right, you go, you have a gradual change from lines slanted upwards to lines slanted downwards, basically. And the distance, the fact that the distances change their separation value is fine. That's actually kind of, that's what we'll get to with GR effects because yay, accelerations. Um, but what that means is there's still a one to one correlation between times that spaces of time that Bob has to spaces of time that Alice has. You don't have that, you know, strong geometric shape where a bunch of time has to all correlate to a single time analysis. Oh, okay. So this, that whole thing was a little vague. Um, can we talk about this in terms of DS squared? Is, is there a way to draw Alice's graph? Well, yeah, I mean, actually, yes, the, fact of the matter is, is that no matter how I draw this and then perhaps you're right no matter how I um, do Alice's versus Bob's right she goes to the thing no matter how I draw this and you can keep it straight. Yellow you can assume line. instantaneous acceleration. Right. The space-time distance, right? The total space-time distance of the yellow curve is going to be greater than the space-time distance for the um, blue curve. Which, let me write that out more. Yet, because the beginning and ending events occur are agreed upon by both observers to occur at the same time, then that means some compression is going on. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. And so because of the relative positioning of these compared to this you end up with her always having less time because she because some of the space time uh distance that they agree upon right those that separation in events she leaves earth and alice gets back to earth some of that space time dis distance has to go into a change in position for her then then um there's always going to be less time that less of that can be put into the time that she experiences over the distance between those two events. Right. The space time distance between those two events. Right. Changes in position steal away from change. The amount of time you experience is a, is one way to interpret it, which is really bonkers. Um, one but, practical, uh, one final Thing. Oh, did you have more, more well, questions? So one way I used to reconcile this is you basically, I used to say, okay, you basically have like a little needle that says you can either have all the time in the universe and not go anywhere. Right. Or you could have go any distance, but uh, have no time. Exactly. And then you get some part of that. You get some ratio between that's, the two. That's, yeah, that's the yeah. correct way to, to exactly okay. think about it, right? Your, your vector. It's either if... If there is no spatial separation, right, it's only, okay, it's this point in one moment in time and then the next moment in time. And very much they will be 
related because you know the thing that was the thing that was at that point in time at that moment will either still be there or not be there and that's very much correlated to what happened in the past makes sense um another a final uh example i think that's important is gps right because we just talked about twin paradox but we don't go off to stars we can't actually see this but we can with global positioning right with our gps and our final location uh, the basic setup, right, of GPS is that there are 24 satellites uh, in six different planes around the uh, around the planet orbiting so that they make a cycle every 24 hours. Each of them has an atomic clock in them, making sure that they keep accurate time. If if I had, um, and basically the idea, if I had, you know, two satellites for the 2D, this 2D case is fine if I have Satellite A constantly emitting its position and its time, and satellite B constantly emitting its position and its time, and there's me who's working on some world line here. Let's say this point emits, and I pick it up here, right? Right, because they are light-like signals, so they'll emit at 45 degree angles. Now, with just that one receiving, I don't know, I could be anywhere on the circle defined by this distance. So I need another, basically, circle to tell me, oh, okay, when I receive the time and position from this satellite, satellite B, I can use that to triangulate my position and say, oh, okay, there's only one point on this yellow curve that I could be. And that's how um, GPS works, effectively, right? Um, it requires some more satellites to set that up, but the elimination of my position from these things is pretty straightforward. So, so what we're saying is, is just by measuring the, the offset of the expected receiving time of the signal versus the time that we know that it actually sent it because it's got an atomic clock and it's synchronized, we're able to do a distance determination right and, and then when, the, when we get enough of those satellite signals at the same time then we can do a triangulation right okay and you can do better if you have more satellites which is why more gps gets to more accurate results but in theory you only need two for here four for 3d because you only need one satellite per position right per dimension that we're keeping track of which is three spatial dimensions and one time dimension right hence the reason here i need two because i've got 2d i've got one linear dimension and one time dimension right now uh the problem that this actually uh, runs into is that I know that, well, because of centripetal acceleration, I can tell you that the speed of the satellite right, at the distance that the satellite is out has to equal the gravitational position, the gravitational potential from the earth, from the mass of the earth and the distance the satellite is out at. I can tell you that then the velocity of the satellite is about 3.9 kilometers per second, which works out to, where is it? Yes, uh, about 1.3 times 10 to the negative 3 times 3 percent C. And you say, wow, one thousandth of a percent? Is that really important? <laughs> well, the proper, if I look at this guy and say, okay, velocity is really small. I expand, I do a Taylor expansion out. The very first order, the very first term that'll affect the amount of time deviation due to, um, due to the fact that the satellite is moving at this velocity is about one half the velocity of the satellite divided by the speed of light squared. Now this works out to about 0.84 times 10 to the negative 10 uh, fractional change in the amount of time that I would measure. What's fun is it turns out that it takes less than a minute of that deviation to accumulate enough difference in where I would say the satellite is versus where the satellite actually is because of um, because of time dilation, 
to throw off the GPS from the required two nanoseconds that our at our you know GPS accuracy needs. So in less than a minute, all of a sudden people are making turns at the wrong distance because you know the satellite information tells them no there should be a road here it's going to be that classic office thing where you turn into a lake because the gps told you to and here not because the gps was wrong but because how you measured time was wrong because of gravitational effects um there's actually, this is, this is fun, so that's just the special relativity part. There's actually a general relativity part that pops up that you have to take into account for because you and I being closer to the Earth than the satellite is mm -hmm. are lower in the gravitational well, and that actually also messes with time. Now... But that sounds like a part two type thing. Absolutely. The way that we've talked about this, this thing um, is... Is how uh, you know we, we've we've given positions for space, and now we've introduced time as a quantity that is also this space-like thing. This called space-time. Now, in normal physics, the way that we naturally do things is we work with vectors, right? Three-dimensional vectors, each with a component, and basically that doesn't change when I look at uh, when I go to four dimensions. The only thing that I do is I go, okay, my 4D vector is just going to have the same components, but now I introduce a zeroth component that I'll say is equal to time. So the natural language of this is that I separate out here, this guy, which I will now shorten to... Now those superscripts, I, those are just constants. They are. A zero, so it really so is... So they're not raising to. This is, this is going to be a notational thing, but okay. we'll quickly introduce. And what we've found is effectively ds squared is going to be similar in structure to a vector dot a vector. Well, because of these constants, what we'll talk about, and I'm just going to quickly tease people with how this is drawn out. What is that doohickey in the middle line? This? For the superscript over the A? No, no. The, this? The middle line. Yeah, what is that? So this is going to be alpha. Alpha will range from 0, 1, 2, 3. Oh, that's an alpha? So yeah. that's A super alpha? A super alpha, e, su uh, e sub alpha. Okay. And what we will get to, and I'm just going to introduce this to um, alpha, beta. Oh, I see what you... Okay. All yeah, right. yeah, yeah. We are setting up where this thing, what we call a metric looks like this and this corresponds to space-time where space-time is flat but what happens when these components are no longer zero changes everything and to see that we'll see you in part two okay and just to be clear you're gonna explain how you got this matrix exactly absolutely okay. All right, cool. My poor buddy. Yes, I. That, how to get that matrix? It's gonna be a bit it's of a pretty, time. pretty fundamental. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's take a break. <laughs> 